there. Thanks for tuning in to VIP Boxing's Bell to Bell podcast. And we're on episode 109. As always, you can watch us on YouTube. You'll be listening on iTunes or Spotify. Say something nice. Say something nasty. We're, we're big boys here. You know me, Steve Lillis. You know John Evans. Uh, tonight's special guest is him. Um, I'm not sure I still call him a, a world away prospect. He's, he's starting to to break through now. He's unbeaten in 14 fights. One of VIP Boxing's uh, upcoming stars, Luke Evans. Luke, thanks for coming on. I think it's the second time we've had you on Bell to Bell. And thank you. Yeah, um, you're welcome. I mean, it's, it's my pleasure, guys. It's always nice joining you. Yeah, and uh, well, obviously we're going to talk about more and more about boxing and all this. But first of all, your, your own fight the other night against Robin Zamora. Um, yeah. Every round... But a, a, an opponent you never switch off against Zamora, isn't he? As I was saying before, he, is it? Do you see him as one of the, the the gatekeepers you have to come through if you got title aspirations? Yeah, I, I'd say that's fair. I mean, he's he's been in with a few good prospects himself uh, internationally, um, and obviously he's from South America, and they're quite known to be tough and rugged. Um, and it was a good fight, and it was a good learning fight for me. But you know, I've had fourteen professional fights now. I think my apprenticeship's over and I think the, that was a good step up that I needed and the right step up at the right time. And now we just slightly increase the opposition yet again. Yeah. And I think yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. that, Luke. Sorry, when, John. When you, you had your taste, didn't you, on the, the big show and you, you seemed to yeah. take to it like a duck to water. You enjoyed the build-up, didn't you? I know you were popular in the build-up before. A lot of you got carried away a little bit on the night and got involved in a, a real war. What like yeah. lessons did you learn then, and and what have you bought through now that you you're building on every every performance? I think it's not to give my opponent uh, any advantage, but to yeah. use my own. Um, I'm I'm a boxer. I'm not a brawler. I'm not a, you know I don't have wars, but I can have a war. But you know I relied on my boxing in this fight, and you know you've seen what I'm capable of. Um, at the arena, I didn't even show half half as what I was good at. Um, and it was a big stage like you said I got carried away um, it's a shame it wasn't an eight rounder because I believe I would have pulled it back despite the two knockdowns but that being said it was good that I you know I tasted them knockdowns because you know I'd rather taste them on the small hall the sm the smaller side of the uh, card than the main event you know for example so um, it was a good experience nevertheless I mean, before we... sorry John no, I'm going to say a bit of a blessing in disguise almost, Luke, because it's been like a, a reminder of what you're good at, what you can do when you when you stick to it and everything. Because I can't remember how long it is since I popped down to Booth's gym to see you years ago and fight slowly building up. You're always going to get there. And it looks like it could be the, over the next 18 months, people are going to see what Luke Evans can do. Definitely. I mean, um, all depends on the opponent as well. I mean, you know, I had Robin Zamora for this fight and, you know, he's given a few lads a good test. Um, you know, Jake James, he's a good undefeated prospect. Yeah. Reg Backin, he's another one. And there was a few international fighters. I think one was called Dimitri Arnzau. I think he's based in like Poland or Germany, somewhere like that. And he was a very good amateur, world world class amateur. So, you know, he's been in there with some good kids and you know, I'd like to think I handled him quite well. So it's a good confidence boost as well. Yeah, and just before we move on um, with our six rounds of chat, uh, has Woody given you, your manager and promoter, Steve Wood, given you any idea when you might be out next? Are you going to go on a big show? Or I know he's going back to Bolton in June. Will you be headlining there again? I should imagine so, yeah. Um, I think that's the next step, really. Um, get back to Bolton, potentially get another eight-rounder or maybe a 10, you know, against the right opponent. Um, and just again, Another big learning fight, maybe another international fight, um, if that's available. You know, myself, I want an English title as soon as possible. But, you know, I understand the politics and how things work. So, you know, I'm going to have to wait for my chance. I understand that. Um, but that being said, just in the meantime, fights like against Robin Zamora, that type of fighter who's going to come and give me a test. No, there's no harm in that. So I don't mind fighting these type of fighters. And also, you're growing into the weight as well. As if you had another yeah. international fight, you know that you know, you're going to grow yeah. into this weight. You know, you're, people got to remember you're you're stepping up, aren't you, from a hunt from, from the super lightweight to this division? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always boxed in and around the welterweight division. Um, 
but I was never really big enough, like physically, to to fill out of that weight. Now I feel like I am. I'm 26 years old. I've got the height. I've got the, you know, I feel like I've got the size, uh, and now I've got the experience, and that's the crucial part. Um, obviously, I've got that one fight under my belt now against a tough Nicaraguan southpaw, you know. So, um, you know, I, I think another another fight like that, and then, you know, a big big fight then either on a big show or against another undefeated prospect. Brilliant. Well, I'll tell you, we'll press on now. You, I think you know how it works, Luke. We chat for three yeah. minutes on each round, and John gets his, uh, his yeah. school bell out there that he nicked from school when he got expelled from sixth form <laughs> or whatever it was. Steve, but, um, Steve Willis, his favourite instrument at school, wasn't it? The dinner bell. Yeah. Well, it would have been because <laughs> I was out here, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to press on. Round one, John, it's your first topic about the guy who... who um, who also had a win at the weekend for the sort of money that Luke's uh, dreaming of earning one day. Yeah. F fingers crossed it's a sign of things to come, but we're seeing people like Dan Aziz and Usyk and people like that getting credit for doing things the old-fashioned way and wanting to challenge themselves and wanting to take on the best. And I think Tim Zoo's cut from that same cloth. You know, we've, I think we've praised Tim on here a couple of times the way he's going about his business. And he was due to fight Charlo, wasn't he, for all the belts in a massive fight in America. Charlo got injured, so straight away he jumped at Tony Harrison and said, yeah, I'll fight Tony Harrison. Wasn't a long delay, he didn't bugger about and sit on his ranking like a lot of British fighters would have done, taking keep busy fights and keeping that ranking position. Tim Zhu jumped straight for one of the more difficult challenges. Took Tony Harrison apart, stopped him, highlight reel finish with them uppercuts, beautiful stuff and... He bounces into that Charlo fight now on real form. And I like Tim Zoo. I like the way he's going about it. He's not relying on his dad's name. He's really making a bit of a mark, I think. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I haven't seen the fight. I've just sort of finished a little clip on Facebook, I think it was. Um, the thing was, I was you know, we're really cynical in this country, I think. I think we got that bit of snobbery about us, which is wrong about boxing. And, you know, we always thought when Tim Zoo, Zoo first come through, and I hadn't seen him, so that shows how ignorant I was being. And say so he come through and I thought, oh, he's there because of his dad. You know, he's getting the superstar treatment in Oz. And then one of his fights, a midweek fight, was on of a box nation towards the end of Sky. And I thought, yeah, he isn't bad. This I can't think what fight it was. I should have made a note of it before. And you know what? Fair play to him, as you say. My thought was, John, he could have gone and taken a gimme to, and waited yeah. for Charlo to recover from... Um, the hand injury, but he didn't. He beat an, a man who sort of beat the man, I suppose you can say. Yeah. Luke? Definitely. Uh, you know, I, I took a few notes here myself, and, you know, Tim Zoo is a son of a legend, Costa Zoo, one of the pound-for-pound -pound greats in his day. Um, You know, it, he's got to have potential to be a legend's son, to live up to that expectation. He's got to handle the pressure. And I think they've done a good job matching him. You know, I've just highlighted some of the... Uh, the wins he's had, Jeff Horn, uh, Dennis Hogan, one of the Inui brothers, and they're all he's won by TKO on on them three fights there. So I think him being matched correctly at the right time, he's 28 years of age now. I think the Charlo fight could be a perfect fight for him. Charlo's in ring activity has not been that great the last few years, so I think maybe now's a good time to get him. Yeah. You know, yeah. Jeff Hall, that was the fight I was. I should have thought of. That was the one I saw him. Yes, so, but on your, he, he, every time he stepped up, he stopped them. But yeah. he, he, it's just the, just the way he's, the way he, he jumped at Tony Harrison without a second thought. You know, the manner he, of victory, the yeah. manner of wanting to challenge himself and the way he went through it. And yeah, it's the sign of a good fight. That. Round two. And Luke, you're going to talk about somebody who was doing some damage about 30 miles away as you were at the same time as you was out pointing Robin Zamora. Definitely, yes. Uh, Diego Pacheco. Is he the next boxing superstar? Personally, I think he's in with a good shout. Now he's with Eddie Earn and Matchroom. I think they'll get him some really good fights. And let's not mention here, you know, let's not forget to mention, Jack Cullen will fight anybody, and he's a very tough lad. So fair play to Jack, that's what I put that out there. Um, Diego Pacheco is special, you know. There's been some very good up-and-coming fighters, you know, Virgil Ortiz, Mauricio Lara, Jesse Rodriguez, Sebastian Fandora. These are all upcoming fighters who have now, you know, tasted that big time and, you know, some of them have been successful. 
And uh, yeah, I think Pacheco's in a really good shout to be the next breakout star, given his age as well. John, you was there, I think, the other night. Yeah, no, no offence, Luke. Do you know what? I, halfway through the night, I was getting ready to jet over to Bolton to get over for your fight. You messaged me, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to come, but I just, something just thought, see and watch how good this Pacheco is, you know, because people were raving about him, sat around me saying, ah, it's not going to go two rounds. And Jack, Jack Cullen's a tough lad, isn't he? We know he's a bit susceptible to body shots and he gets hit, but he's a stiff night's yeah. work just because of the size of a lump and how game he is. And Pacheco yeah. took about two minutes to work him out and just destroyed him. I, I was really, really impressed. Just looked so cool about it. Being away from home didn't phase him, didn't bother him. And he, he just looked a completely different level to Jackie. He was really, really good. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but what Steve Wood said a similar to, to you. He said, you know, the first, most of the first round, Jack knew, you know, was just doing his thing. And he thought, oh, we're doing okay. And then he just switched on it, almost as if he read him so quickly what he had to do. And I think that's what impressed Woody so much. Yeah, within Definitely. two minutes, but, but he just neutralised Jack's jab. And Jack's jab's probably like getting it from the other side of the ring, I'd imagine. <laughs> And second round, it wasn't even a factor. It, it was really impressive stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Round... Great matchmaking. Round three, will it happen on April 29th? Fury Usyk. Now, we're recording this on Monday night. And so far today, um, there's been Tyson Fury removing rematch clauses that he says Usyk wanted. There's been amazing stuff on social media from Usyk calling him greedy belly. Every I'm bored of all the talk. I just want the fight. But every time I see a greedy belly clip, I'm just in stitches, especially with his pronounced English accent. And Frank Warren says we're going to get it over at the line. Um, I just find it now. We're five and a half weeks to April 29th. Surely it can't be made in that time. It isn't just doing the deal. There's so much promotion and everything else that needs to, to go with it. I, I'm, I just, I just hope it happens, but I don't think it's going to happen in April 29. I just want to see what you guys think. Go on, Luke. Yeah, I, I personally don't think it's going to happen. I think the fight will happen. I just don't think it'll happen on that date. I think the date will get pushed back, or one of them will take another fight. That's right. Uh, possibly Fury. Um, I think Usyk. You know, you've got to respect him. You know lowering his demands and things like that. And I think the longer this goes on, this fiasco, the more it, the more bad it looks on Tyson. And and I'm a big fan of Tyson, but I feel like he needs to kind of get this fight over the line. Because like you said, like you said, there's not, not much time to go. Um, I do fancy Fury to win the fight as well, which is another, another matter. But a 70-30 split, is that's not right. It's a 60-40 for me, personally. Um, but, you know... We'll have to see what happens, won't we? Yeah. I've got like two thoughts. Maybe this is the promotion because look how much attention it's getting. Every time one of them says something, it's massive news, isn't it? They've not got yeah. enough time to do all the, the usual press conferences and stuff like that. Maybe this is the promotion. But the bigger part of my brain is saying Tyson's got another plan in mind and he's just trying to delay it. I, mean, I tell you, out of all this, Fury, he's not coming out of it very well, is he? No. Tyson, you know, U Usyk's the one who's looking to clear every obstacle to make the fight and Tyson's just putting more and more there. I, I'd love it to happen, but but time's pressing on a bit. I'd love it. You know what? I was thinking last week, I was seeing Joe Joyce pulling out of his fight and maybe he would fight Tyson in June at Wembley and then they'd meet. But we've all got these all sort of agendas in our own mind, I think. But no. Brought, um, the, brought the rule of bell to bell then. Yeah. You... <laughs> The juggernaut. We the don't juggernaut, call him yeah, we, only call Joe, we can only call the juggernaut the juggernaut. John's going to tell me off. Are we three minutes in there, John? No, you got 30 seconds, yeah? Oh, 30 minutes. No, I, 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 30 seconds. I think it happens the end of the year. I can see him going to Cardiff yeah. or somewhere. I can see Tyson fight. having that interim fight. Yeah, big summer fight in the stadium. And what what was Us what does Usyk do? Martin Bacola, um, you know, that Dubois. sort of level. Dan that, Daniel Dubois. Yeah. Dubois, yeah. Maybe they, maybe they share it. a bill. Maybe you see and Fury share a bill. Hey, if, they're, if they're arguing over money now, when they're going to fight each other, there's not going to be enough money in the kitty from both to defend titles and pay no. a mandatory challenger in Dubois and maybe someone like Joe Joyce. But imagine a night like that. Oh, ooh, ooh, the old-fashioned old way of doing it. Yeah. Round four, you want to talk about matchmaking, John? Yeah. I'll, 
mainly one for you to answer this, Steve. Um, it's always there's a lot of pressure on matchmakers to pick the right fights for the up for the prospects to make them look good, to teach them something, not get them beat, but give them tick off a few more boxes. And I know the trainer has the final say and promoter have, have their issue, but there is a lot of pressure on matchmaking. Now, I was watching the fight from weekend uh, with Mr. Iqbal. Um, got upset and got stopped in the fifth round. Um, I watched the fight and I thought it was a good match. I thought style for style, if Iqbal had been on his game, imposed himself, he would have won. He wouldn't have had an easy night, but I thought it was a perfect, perfectly matched fight and a perfect learning fight. So what's it like, Steve, watching that unfold in front of you when... You know you've suggested the opponent. You know you've had your your conversations with the trainer and stuff. Is it I, what's it like for a matchmaker? For that fight, I told and um, he won't mind. We've been discussing it with him today and after the fight Saturday. I told Ant all week how hard I fought this fight, and it, it was a fight. And you know what? The fair play, Ant Crawler. He he was offered uh, another fight. He took, and the guy picked another fight who was a dangerous fight. And this come along, I said, look, it's a week out. This is all there is at the moment. Something else might come. This is really fucking hard, a hard fight. He come back and he said, Iqbal was the, the real deal, that sort of thing. He's for real. He was so, he's been so sold on Sahir. It's unbelievable. And then for that first round, you thought, wow, Crawler was right here. Anthony was right. The way he was superb. And then you just see him sort of, he got caught, and then he seems to think he got caught on the temple in the second round and never recovered. But it, you just saw it change and change. But that Espina is a handful. He's one of those guys, he doesn't look good, but he's really effective. He pours that jab out and suddenly that right hand come out. He's had two big wins in a week. Now the phone's going to, he's over here for a while. He's not going to get another job unless he's yeah. fighting bit much bigger men. But that, it, I was worried. Like, and then when, when you're watching something like Luke's fight, for example, I mean, someone else got the opponent and they just got me to go to Matthew with it. And uh, Matt, I, think, I don't know whether Matthew discusses it with you or you leave it to him, Luke. You can tell yeah, me yeah. That's that in a minute. And um, you, you're sitting watching that. And I was just thinking, I'm not just saying it uh, because you're here. Wait, I know you couldn't pin him down. He's a good opponent. I'm thinking, you're doing to Robin Zamora what good fighters do to him. Yeah, and that that was what that, what that sort of thing goes through in my mind. But but there's been a couple where I've been like cross legged and all that, yeah. worried what's yeah. going to happen. But um, yeah, that then, could be in your mind. And, you know, especially if you're a ticket seller on a big show. Yeah. You know, the promoters and the managers. You know, That's, the hearts are going to mouth. And you know, at the end of the day, it's up to the fighter though. And and yeah. obviously the trainer knows the fighter best. I think in the case of myself, I thought that was perfect matchmaking for the right time. Same with Sahir Iqbal. I thought. You know, Sahir was good enough to come through that test, and it was uh, unfortunate that he uh, that he suffered a stoppage defeat. I think he'll come again, and it, and sometimes it can make a fighter as well. You know, these type of fights. You know, it's yeah, it's a massive upset, but you know, he can come again. He's still young, so and and I rate Sahir. You know, he beat me in the amateurs um, when I was like 16, 17. So I've always watched him since. I think he was like ranked number six in the world when I boxed him. Um, but yeah, it was it's a, it was a, quite a shock to see, and I think uh, matchmaking, you know, ten for ten for learning, ten for earning. Mm. I don't know who said that, but someone said that, and it stuck with me. And I think it's right. It's brilliant. That. In this day and age, a lot of people want to take risks, but if you're taking the right risks, then you know, could pay off. Unfortunately, that one didn't though. Yeah. When, when when I rang Matthew with that fight, um. I think it was a while ago. He had plenty yeah. of notice for yeah. more. That's got to be said. He had a lot more notice than he did for think for Jake's fight. I think he had five. Yeah. He had plenty of time to prepare. Weeks. He had six weeks or seven weeks. Yeah, um, and he come off a win as well. That's right. Gary. Yeah. When I go to Matthew, does Matthew go to you with that fight, or does he say this yeah. is the right fight, or does he say no, what no. do you think? Have a look. We have a quick. We have a quick discussion about it. You know, give it a little watch here and there. But you know, sometimes pride can get the best the best of you. But you know, I, I'm I'm happy to fight whoever myself. But for someone else, it might be different. But Matthew knows me as a fighter. He knows what I'm capable of. He sees it in the gym every day. So we was confident in that in that taking that fight, and we took it. And I thought it was the right time to take it. So John, the worst part of doing this matchmaking I've been doing for a few months is when it's a Monday like today, and you've got <laughs> seven fights on Saturday night. 
and you're sitting up on a Monday thinking, I'm going to go for a run or go to the gym. And then in a space of half hour, you get free pullouts for different excuses. And then you're spending all day trying to rescue them and manage to rescue two of them, but one to go. That's the worst part of being a matchmaker. And the worst part will be the day a trainer wants to kill me because I've got it wrong. <laughs> but no. no one has so far. I've got, a, well, that one I did warn Crawler and there was, oh, I'll tell you what one I, I, I got, well, I didn't get wrong. What Lerone Harrison was fighting Carl Sampson. Carl was playing the game as such. You know, there was no walkabout, but he was just going through the motions. And then he got cut in the second round, knew he got 28 days and just really upped his game. Yeah, Carl yeah. can fight. Yeah, don't worry about that. We were talking about it Saturday night about, I was saying, you're an A-class journeyman. You could fight the really good kids who turn over. And he said, you know what? He said, you can get a few hundred quid more from there, but I'd rather be fighting the B-class journeyman for less. Regular, regular work. Regular and longevity. Yeah, definitely. Good, good point. Um, round five, Luke, your final topic. Uh, upset yep. at the weekend, Yoka and uh, Tony Yoka, Carlos Takam. Yep, Carlos Takam, 42 years of age, uh, heavyweight, must add, against the 30 year old um, Tony Yoka. I want my question to you guys is Does father time matter in boxing? For me personally, I think it's a mentality thing. I think it can be physical if you let it, if you know him when to go on. I think it all starts with the mind. I think if you're 42 years old, you're close to retirement. If you're carrying on as a heavyweight that long, then that's understandable. But if you're a welterweight, for example, and you're 42 years old, you think you'd be retired around 33, 34, 35. My, yeah, like I said, my question to you guys is, is father time a myth? Um, I, I it is. I, I don't think so, because you see, maybe it is they go on. You see fighters who are aging and slowing up and can't pull the trigger anymore. Now, I'm not a boxer. You know, you you, you obviously work the mental side of it. You know the mentality and all that. I always think, it, I'd say to me, it's not a myth because you see too many fighters who have slowed up, you know, not as quick, haven't got the movement. For example, you see fighters like, um, okay, I'll go on about Amir Khan. You know, once he's, you know, towards the, the last, few years of his career when his feet was slowing he was getting caught a lot more is that is them is their mentality would that be down to, could that also be down to the mental side i don't know i'll ask you luke and you, know, you can answer that in a second i personally think it is because you know he's gone to chase the money outside of boxing and i think that's deterred him physically um and like i said i don't think you'd see amir khan fighting at 40 years old it just it would never happen so like i said i think it's a mentality thing of knowing when to call it a day, or when to carry on and chase that last payday, John. Yeah, I. Oh, I think Traffic inevitably, is. inevitably you slow down, don't you? You know, you. Yeah. You, you your body slows down, but I think if you still want to do it, I I think that plays a big part of it. If you don't want to fight and you're fighting for money, you're not training as hard. You're not putting the effort in. You. It's hard yeah. work. You feel every short and you're scared of throwing a punch because you're worried about getting hit back whereas if you, if your money's secure and you actually want to do it and you're doing it for enjoyment and because it's your passion and I, I think you can go on for a lot longer so I think I think you're both right I think obviously your body breaks down but also if you're doing something you love it's not work so yeah. you perform better so I, I think there's two sides to it but yeah you know I'm not losing any sleep over over Yoka getting beaten and his career wow. falling apart, given that he missed three drugs tests in about 2017, 2018. Yeah. Should have taken and, a drug for his heart. He's not yeah. got any Tony Yoka. That's no. two in a row now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And Takam, he's coming off a loss as well, um, quite surprisingly. And he gave he gave Joshua a good fight a few years ago. You yeah, know? He's, he's so, good Takam. Good he's heavyweight. Good when you... When you mentioned that you give Joshua a good fight, you look back on his record. It, you know, he's been one of those real solid heavyweights over the years. He always never far away, never quite there. And it's good yeah. to show it... a bit of love for him, I hear. In the same category as Chisora, that type of yeah. world level, you know, just there. That, that, that's a great analogy. Good yeah, a good, good opponent good fight now. Um, round six. So yeah, um, John, I want to talk to a lot of both of you, but I know John maybe watches a lot more female women's boxing than I do. I just think Chantel Cameron, Katie Taylor. Now, although Chantel's got the titles, I think 
Taylor might have held one of the titles she's got once. I think Taylor going, um, Chantel Cameron's going to go to Ireland and this is going to be a crowning moment. I think she overnight, she is going to become a star. A lot, a lot of people have heard of her, although she's got the undisputed super lightweight titles. I think she is going to become a star overnight and beat Katie Taylor in Ireland. I just yeah, think it's right I, I, fight, right time. I'm with you, yeah. I, I fought it for a long, long, long time. And if they'd made this fight 18 months ago, I would have been even more sure that Chantel would have beat Katie Taylor. And she she punches hard. People forget she was a good amateur. She was on Team GB for a long, long time. No one's come close to beating Chantel. No one. She made Jessica McCaskill look like a rank amateur. McCaskill gave Taylor a real hard fight. Taylor's coming up. She's getting hit more than ever. I'm not sure she can stand up to Chantel's punching for 10 rounds. I know Serrano can punch, but she's done a lot at featherweight. Chantel's a big, strong, 140-pounder who likes to fight, is skillful, and she's going to land on Taylor. And she also won't be bothered by the atmosphere, Chantel. I, I, yeah. I'm with you. I, I pick Chantel to win. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, could this be the passing of the torch for yeah, me? Yeah. Um, you know, in one mind on Katie Taylor's side, I think, will Ireland have an influence on getting just getting her over that line? She's a combination puncher. She throws a lot of straight punches, four, five, six punch combos. Um, Chantel Cameron can bang, though. Um, and again, two-minute rounds in female boxing, goals like that. And Katie Taylor, the last few fights, when she's been dragged into a bit of a war, she had struggled with the gas. Um, I think Chantel Cameron can expose that um, if she gets the tactics right. Um, like I said, I think this potentially could be the passing of the torch. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a hell of a fight. And in Ireland as well, you know, it's going to be a great event. I, I do. I, I think Chantel should put it on her, set a high pace. I, I, I can't I, see Katie stopping her. I agree. I, I think that result, I might be, look stupid, but I think Katie's stopping us off the table. So if yeah. Chantel sets a hot pace, lands her punches, I, I think she can do it. Yeah, no doubt. She actually that fast. I think Katie Taylor um, will get the early rounds in the bank and then may fade in the second half of the fight. And that's where she has to come on strong. But, but she has I to think... be chipping away early, doesn't she? Like, even if she's yeah. losing rounds, she, Chantel's got to be yeah. chipping away and landing. Yeah. Can't let her settle. No, she can't let her settle. Fellas. I think we've run out of time, have we, there? I yeah, I to, we, we went a bit... We were, we were being strict on it. It went a little bit skew with on yeah, the matchmaking one, so I forgot to press it then. Oh, well, Easy. don't worry. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been great speaking to you both. Luke, you're a brilliant guest. We've got to get you on here more often because you're, you're good, uh, you know your boxing, you can see you care for the sport. Yeah, maybe one day when, uh, when it's all said and done, you know, hopefully I could have a career around yeah, the sport yeah. in some way, so... Yeah, you never know. Hey, mate. Hey, if, any, if, if either time any of us actually have an holiday, Steve, and have a break from this, Luke can step Luke's in, guys. Luke's the man. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get Luke in, mate. You know what? I, I, I might struggle for next week. I might get Luke in to do it with you next week. We can get a guest in. Yeah, I'll get someone sorted. But I might yeah. be all right. If not, Luke, <laughs> would you go co-presenting next week if I'm not about? Definitely, yeah. Without and a doubt. Then you can send it to me, John, and I'll still chop it all up for you. It's just next Monday I might have a problem. Yeah. We'll sort that out. Well, I'll speak to you in the week, Luke. Um, thanks very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And, Luke, get some good, well, some bad food down here for a few weeks now <laughs> or a couple of weeks. Back in next Monday. Oh, I already said... can't start training again. Really, yeah? Already? Yeah, yeah can't wait. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, thanks. For... for all boxing, info, news, and latest interviews, amateur and pro across and off, Click and subscribe. VIP Boxing Promotions. Also, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook.